Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we will be discussing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 3rd February 2019. The topics to be discussed today are reflected on your screen and the time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's begin. This news appears on page number 8 in the first section of the Hindu newspaper and talks about the recent fish count which was held at the coal wetlands. From its syllabus, under the prelims, it will form a part of general issues on environment ecology and for your mains, it will form a part of GS Paper 3 under the category of environmental conservation. The context of this news is that on World Wetland Day, which is observed annually on 2nd February, a fish count was conducted in the coal wetland, which has recorded 82 aquatic species. Let us know a few things about the coal wetlands. The coal wetlands are basically located in the central Kerala, in the Thrissur and the Malapuram districts and eventually merge with the Vembanand Lake which is the longest lake in India and the largest lake of Kerala. Thus the coal wetlands nurture one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems in South India. Secondly, the coal wetlands are a Ramsar site that is a wetland of international importance designed under the Ramsar Convention. Thirdly, the coal wetlands are an important stopover in the Central Asia Indian Flyway which is the migratory routes for all the birds that fly south from Siberia in the months of winter. So therefore all those migratory birds which fly from the cold areas of Siberia in the month of winter stop at the coal wetlands on their route of migration. Next, the fish count which was conducted on 2nd February that is on the World Wetland Day has come out with certain findings. Number one is that coal wetlands have 82 aquatic species out of which orange chromite, dwarf pufferfish, malabar leaf fish, etc. are the most prominent ones. Secondly, during this fish count, the teams also came across six non-native species in the coal wetlands. Non-native species are basically the invasive species which are not native to that area. Thus, the presence of this six species of non-native fish in the coal is of significant concern because they have a potential to compete with and eventually outnumber the native species. Amongst the six non-native species, the most prominent one is the Amazonian sucker catfish, whose numbers are pretty alarming. Since we were talking about coal wetlands, it is very important to know what exactly a wetland is in the first place. So any place in which the land, whether seasonally or permanently, is covered with water, that place is called as a wetland. The water covering a land can either be salty or fresh or somewhere in between, that is mixed. Therefore, any place which is seasonally or permanently covered by water is known as a wetland. Secondly, the wetlands can be in the form of mangroves, marshes, ponds, swamps, lagoons, lakes or even flood plains for that matters. And most often than not, very large wetlands are actually a combination of various different types of wetlands. For example, just now we discussed that the coal wetland eventually merges with the Vembanand Lake. The reason why wetlands are very important is because of their carbon capturing abilities. Research has found that the wetlands can store 50 times more carbon than the rainforests. Therefore, they can be very useful to keep away the heat trapping gases like the carbon dioxide which contribute to climate change, especially global warming. Lastly, wetlands also act as a natural water filter. The reason is that wetlands can trap phosphorus and heavy metals like iron and lead in their soils, thereby filtering the pollutants. Further, the wetlands can also transform the dissolved nitrogen in the soil into nitrogen gas and can also help to neutralize various harmful bacteria. Thus, wetlands are one of the most important carbon sinks which occur naturally and can also act as a natural water filter. This news appears on page number 1 in the second section of the Hindu newspaper and is talking about the turtle conservation efforts taken by the temples in Assam. From a syllabus perspective, it will form a part of general issues on environment ecology under the prelims. The news basically says that with consistent efforts, the temples in Assam have been able to revive the turtle population, especially of the black softshell turtle which was declared as extinct in the wild under the IUCN's red list in the year 2002. Let us look at a few details about the black softshell turtle whose population has now been revived by the temples in Assam. 
Now the black softshell turtle is a freshwater turtle originally native to the river Brahmaputra in Assam and the Chittagong areas in the neighboring Bangladesh. In the year 2002 it was declared as extinct in the wild by the IUCN's red list. Under the Wildlife Protection Act of India it comes under schedule 1 and the main reason for such low population of this turtle is that it is hunted for its meat and cartilage and therefore though it was found in abundance along the Brahmaputra flood plains due to its extensive hunting its number had significantly reduced and now it is rarely spotted in the wild in fact the only places you can find them are at a few ponds in the temple shrines and due to the consistent efforts by the temples in assam this black softshell sea turtle is now being released into the pobitora wildlife sanctuary where it will be provided with continuous protection and care the pobitora wildlife sanctuary which is located in assam is basically very famous for its one horned rhino in addition to the black softshell turtle two other turtle species have been moved from the temple pond into the wild the two are the indian softshell turtle and the peacock softshell turtle now the indian softshell turtle has been classified as vulnerable under the iucn and is also protected under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act the reason why indian softshell turtle is vulnerable is because it has been continuously hunt for its meat the indian softshell turtle are native to regions of south asia and are found in rivers like the ganges indus and the mahanadi the third turtle is the peacock softshell turtle it too is listed as vulnerable under the iucn and is protected under the schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act so therefore in total three turtle species the black softshell turtle the indian softshell and the peacock softshell which were up till now being conserved in the temple ponds are now being released back into the wild now as far as turtles in india are concerned We found total of 28 different kind of species of turtle in our country out of which almost 20 are found in the state of Assam. Most of these turtle species are on the verge of extinction or are mostly vulnerable. The main reason is that they are hunted down for their meat and eggs. Other reasons include the environmental practices of silt mining and encroachment on the wetlands which is one of their natural habitats and even the change in the flooding pattern of the rivers has led to a very disastrous impact. on the turtle population especially in the state of assam and it is due to these reasons that almost 70% of the species which are found in assam are now threatened with extinction so therefore from a discussion what you basically need to remember is that assam has a maximum number of turtle species in our country and you should also remember the name of the black softshell turtle which has been declared as extinct in the wild as per the iucn with this let's move on to our next news This news appears on page number 1 in the first section of the Hindu newspaper and is stating that Kerala has become the first state in India to set up a price monitoring and research unit for drug prices violation. From its labels perspective it will fall under GS paper 2 under the sub category of government policies and intervention for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation. The context of the article is that Kerala has become the first state in India to set up a price monitoring and research unit to track violation of prices of essential drugs and medicinal devices under the drugs price control order let us know a few things about this price monitoring and research unit now this price monitoring and research unit was first proposed by the national pharmaceutical pricing authority 5 years back but till now none of the state had actually set up a pmru so therefore after 5 years of it being first proposed Kerala has become the first state to finally set up a price monitoring and research unit. This price monitoring and research unit will act as a price regulator for pharmaceuticals in the state of Kerala and would also track violations of the drug prices. Now the reason why there is a need for a PMRU is because currently there is no price control review mechanism which exists in any state. And the reason why there is no price control review mechanism is because there is a lack of field link between the national pharmaceutical pricing authority the state drug controllers and other players like the state drug inspectors to monitor the drug prices so what happens is an nppa fixes certain price for various essential drugs but whether those prices are being adhered to or not that cannot be checked by the nppa because there is no proper link between the state drug controllers the drug inspectors or even the nppa to review this price adherence 
Therefore, in this backdrop that there exists no price control review mechanism in the states, the National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority had recommended five years back to set up a PMRU as a price regulator who would even check and track violations of prices for essential drugs and medical devices. Let us now see how establishing a PMRU will help in price review mechanism. Now for a very long time, all the pharmaceutical companies in our country have been accused of overcharging prices for various drugs, especially the essential drugs which fall under the scheduled category fixed by the DPCO. Therefore now, this PMRU will act as a price regulator for such pharmaceutical companies because it will help to track violation of prices by these companies. The PMRU will assist the state drug controllers as well as the NPPA as it will monitor the notified prices of medicines in that state. It will detect any violation of the provisions of the DPCO. It will ensure that the pharmaceutical companies are complying with the prices set by the NPPA. Further, it would also collect test samples of medicines. And lastly, it would also compile a market-based data of the various scheduled and non-scheduled drugs and formulations. Hence, what is of importance is to remember that PMRU will monitor the prices of medicine, will look into price compliance by the pharmaceutical companies, will even track violation of the provisions of the DPCO and the various prices set by the MPPA and would eventually compile a market-based data of the various scheduled and non-scheduled formulations and drugs. Let us now look at some of the details about the National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority. The NPPA functions in the Department of Pharmaceuticals under the Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. The main function of the NPPA, as the name suggests, is to fix as well as revise the prices of the controlled bulk drugs and formulations. Further, the NPPA also has the mandate to enforce such prices in the country and to make available such medicines in the country. Therefore, the NPPA not only fixes and revises the prices of scheduled drugs, but it also enforces those prices and ensures that such medicines are actually available in the market. Secondly, in an event, if the manufacturers are overcharging for a drug or a medicine, then the NPPA also has the duty to recover that excess amount or that overcharge amount from these manufacturers. Lastly, it is not just for the controlled drugs, but also the prices of decontrolled drugs are monitored by the NPPA so that their prices are kept at a reasonable level in the market. Because if NPPA is not there, there is a lot of possibility that all the decontrolled drugs in our country will be exorbitantly charged by the manufacturers and will eventually not be affordable by the common people. Therefore, NPPA also has the mandate to monitor the prices of decontrolled drugs. With this, let's move on to our next news. This news appears on page number 12 in the first section of the Hindu newspaper and is stating that the Maharashtra government has withdrawn the amendment bill to the Maharashtra Agriculture Produce Marketing Act of 1963. From the perspective of your syllabus, it will fall under GS Paper 3 under the subcategory of Transport and Marketing of Agricultural Produce and Issues and Related Constraints. Before we talk about what amendments the Maharashtra government wanted to bring in its APMC Act, let us first know a few things about the Agricultural Produce Market Committee. Now, as far as the background of APMC is concerned, even before independence, to regulate the agricultural trade practices, the then government of India had prepared a model bill and had circulated to all the state governments. Then after independence, on lines of that model bill, various states in our country enacted the Agricultural Produce Markets Regulation Acts. And it is under this act that Agricultural Produce Market Committees were established. So basically, the APMC is a statutory market committee which is constituted by a state government. The reason is that agriculture is under list 2, therefore it's a state subject. So therefore the state government has the mandate to set up a market committee. So this APMC is constituted for trade in certain notified agricultural, horticultural or livestock products under the various APMC Act issued by the specific state government. So therefore for every geographically delineated market area, there shall be a market committee which will have jurisdiction over that entire market area. So this agricultural produce market committee was basically constituted to frame the various rules for that market area under its jurisdiction as well as to enforce them. 
The main aim of the APMC in every state is to provide for improved regulation in the marketing of the agricultural produce, to bring in a more efficient marketing system for the agricultural produce, to promote agricultural export as well as agricultural processing, as well as for the proper administration of markets for these agricultural produce in the state. So to recapitulate, you need to remember that for every market area, an agricultural produce market committee is constituted which will have the jurisdiction over that entire market area and would frame rules for that market area. Further, this APMC is constituted for trade in only certain notified agricultural produce. That is, it is not for all agricultural produce, but only for certain notified agricultural produce, which again will be notified by the state government under the Act. The main aim to bring in APMC was to improve the market regulation of agricultural produce to make the marketing system more efficient as well as to have better administration of agricultural produce in the state. As specified earlier, every state has its own specific APMC Acts. However, these existing agriculture marketing system in various states has their own problems. The first is the market fee and charges. Every market committee is authorized to collect a market fees from the buyers or traders for the sale of those notified agricultural produce. In addition to this market fee, the farmers have to pay high commission charges to the various commission agents and middlemen to actually sell their produce in these mandis. Therefore, the high market fee and charges is one of the major problems with the current state APMCs. Second is that the APMC Act of the states have divided the entire state into various notified market committees which has led to highly fragmented markets in the state. Thirdly, though at some places you have highly fragmented markets, in some other states of a country, there are insufficient numbers of market in the first place. Therefore, the density of these regulated markets is very different for different parts of a country. Therefore, the lack of uniformity as far as numbers of markets in various states are concerned is another problem with the state APMCs. Fourth is the restriction in licensing. So, under the APMC, Licenses are given to the commission agents. But over a period of time, there has now been a monopoly of these licensed traders and these already existing licensed traders act as a major entry barrier for the new entrepreneurs or competitors to come in. Therefore, this monopoly by the licensed trader is preventing competition. Fifth point is the monopoly of the APMCs. Now, since the APMC acts have made it mandatory for the farmers to sell all their crops in that mandi, on that specified market area only, this has led to a monopoly of APMCs because now the farmers can only sell their produce at mandis and cannot sell it outside in the market. So finally what happened, looking at this inefficient practices of various state APMCs, the Ministry of Agriculture in the year 2003 came out with a model APMC Act for this agricultural marketing and then advised the state governments to amend their state-specific APMC Act on the lines of this Model APMC Act of 2003. The main aim of the Model APMC Act of 2003 is as follows. Firstly, it wants to deregulate the agricultural marketing system in India because currently, as we discussed, it is the APMCs which have the monopoly for trade in the agricultural produce. Second, it wants to provide freedom to farmers to sell their produce even outside these mandis or market areas. Thirdly, it wants to promote investment in the marketing infrastructure. Fourth, it even wants the corporate or the private sector to undertake various marketing activities in order to facilitate a national market for agricultural produce. Fifth, as we had discussed, that due to the monopoly of the licensed traders, new players could not enter this sector. Therefore, one of the another aim of the model APMC is to increase the competitiveness of this agricultural market by providing a common registration of market intermediaries. So therefore, it wants to do away with the license charge and wants to bring in a system where there can be a common registration for all the licensed commission agents and intermediaries. Now, the amendment bill to the Maharashtra Agricultural Produce Marketing Act had the following features. Firstly, the bill wanted that certain essential items should be removed from the purview of the APMCs and should be allowed to be sold outside the mandis or the market areas. However, this move was opposed by the APMCs of Mumbai and Pune because they said that such amendment would severely limit their powers. Another amendment under the bill 
was that the APMCs can levy cess or market fee only on the produce which is brought and traded inside their mandis but cannot charge any kind of fee for the goods sold outside their mandis this move again met with a lot of criticism especially from the various APMCs so therefore now the government is trying to abolish this levy system altogether but then again this is right now in talks and we do not know if the government can actually do so or not the third point was that for all the purchases which are more than 2 lakh rupees the traders can directly pay the farmers and can bypass the middlemen that is if the trade amounted to more than 2 lakhs then there is no requirement of the middlemen and the traders can directly make payment to the farmers but then again this provision is opposed by the traders as well as the farmers organization therefore these three were the major amendment which were proposed to the maharashtra apmcs but due to the widespread opposition which this amendment had met the maharashtra government has now withdrawn its bill from the legislative council with this let's move on to our next news this news appears on page number 12 in section 1 of the hindu newspaper and is talking about the insufficient funding for the mg narega screen from a syllabus it will form a part of gs paper 2 under the sub topic of government policies and interventions and issues arising out of their design as well as under the topic of issues related to human resources and the topic of issues related to poverty before we talk about the problem of insufficient fund which the mg narega scheme is facing let us very briefly talk about what the mg narega is all about The full form of the MG Narega is Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act as the name suggests it's an employment guarantee act which was introduced in 2005 through the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act of 2005 but was officially notified in the year 2006 in 2010 Narega was renamed as the MG Narega as far as the aim of the MG Narega scheme is concerned it wants to enhance the livelihood security of households in rural india so this scheme basically wants to provide more livelihood opportunities for households in rural india please remember it is only for rural india and not for urban areas and it is for this reason that the implementing authority for this scheme is the ministry of rural development with the broader aim of enhancing the livelihood security mg narega envisages certain objectives through which it basically wants to improve the livelihood security the first component of the scheme is that it aims to provide 100 days of wage employment per year to every rural household so here again you need to keep in mind that it seeks to provide 100 days of wage employment not to individual people but to one rural household further the job or the work which is allotted under the mg narega is basically to create more durable rural assets that is to say the work or the job which is provided under mg narega is for the construction of infrastructure like roads bridges etc hence in that capacity mg narega provides two things one is poverty alleviation because it is providing 100 days of wage employment and second is infrastructure creation as the employment which is being provided is to create durable rural assets further in addition to giving employment mg narega also aims at social inclusion especially of the vulnerable sections like women scs and the sts lastly since the employment has to be provided by the gram panchayat in the village mg narega again has the objective to strengthen the panchayati rural institution in our country in addition to these components there are certain important points which you need to remember about mg narega the first is that this scheme is a demand driven program which means that worker has to be hired when he demands for a job and not when the government wants it so basically what happens is that under mg narega a person can go and ask for work and within 15 days he has to be provided with work else if the government fails to provide him with work in 15 days then he has to be provided an unemployment allowance so in that sense this is the only scheme in a country which is demand driven because the government cannot refuse work to any person coming and asking for it so therefore if the demand increases then the supply for the jobs also has to increase keeping in mind its objective of social inclusion this scheme mandates that one third of the workers have to be women further not just social inclusion the scheme also aims at financial inclusion 
as now wages are electronically transferred to the workers bank account or the post office through the dbt system lastly all those assets which are created under the mg narega will now have a geo tagging now that we have understood how the mg narega works let us look at some of the issues or the main problems which are coming in the way of its implementation the first issue is of insufficient budget allocation and this is the point which basically has been highlighted in this news article the news article states that the mg narega scheme has been allocated rupees 60000 crores in the budget of 2019-20 however this budget which is allocated is lot less than the amount spent under mg narega in the current year that is 2018-19 hence highlighting the major problem of insufficient budget allocation because what happens due to financial crunches even if people go and ask for work work is being denied to them because there is no money to actually make payment to them so eventually the lack of funds is leading to a major gap between the demand and supply as far as mg narega is concerned because though the demand for work is there the supply of work is not adequate or equal because there is no money to actually make payment to the workers in fact various research have found out that in the year 2017-18 the employment which is provided to people under mg narega was 32% less than what was actually demanded by the workers thus again highlighting the deep contrast between the demand and supply under the mg narega stemming from the first issue is the second problem of delay in payments due to lack of funds firstly work is being denied secondly if the work is being provided the payments are made very late to the workers making delay in payment another major issue in its implementation the third point is slowly that mg narega is shifting to a supply driven program let us understand why what happens is that the state government submits a labor budget to the center a labor budget basically contains the anticipated labor demand for the next financial year in that state now the center goes through this labor budget and then approves that labor budget which is called as the approved labor budget but of late what has started to happen is that center has reduced the number of days of work under this approved labor budget and has also put a cap on the funds which can be given out under the mg narega scheme so now the state governments are not allowed to generate employment above the limits which have been agreed under this approved labor budget eventually in reality making mg narega a more supply driven program rather than a demand driven program because now the supply side has been fixed and only that much work can be given which can actually be funded by the state government but this is very much against the principle of mg narega which stated that no matter how much work is demanded by a person the government ought to provide them with the job opportunity the fourth point is that under mg narega the wages which are given to the workers are very poor in fact the mg narega wages are much lower than the minimum wages in most of the states and this poor wage has actually pushed the marginalized section of our society to take very hazardous and vulnerable jobs fifth is an another common issue which is found across all states and that is fabrication of job cards so basically what happens the employer create fictitious workers and in their account books they show that the payments have been made to various workers but in reality those workers do not exist now these fives are not exhaustive problems which are faced by the mg narega in addition to these five other problems are the ineffective grievance redressal poor quality of assets created large number of incomplete work insufficient involvement of the panchayati raj institutions etc but our discussion would be incomplete if we do not talk about the achievements which the mg narega has been able to gain ever since its implementation the first major achievement is that it has actually an alternate livelihood security for the people in the rural area by providing them with an alternate employment especially especially during that time of the year when there is no agricultural activity mg narega has been a powerful instrument for the empowerment of poor women as it has provided them with not just livelihood but a safe and dignified place of work thirdly mg narega has also helped in financial inclusion because now the payment of wages is made directly through the bank account or the post office under the dbt lastly mg narega has helped with the infrastructure creation in the rural areas which has led to overall development of the gram panchayats lastly in order to tackle these issues 
there are certain suggestions which the government should implement first is that there should be proper or rather sufficient fund allocation for the mg narega under the budget secondly the government should ensure that at least minimum and adequate wages are being provided to the workers under this scheme thirdly to tackle the problem of incomplete projects we require a much more effective monitoring of the projects under the mg narega so that all these projects can be completed in time and even the quality of the assets which are produced under mg narega can be ascertained and guaranteed fourthly the government should provide for a better grievance redressal mechanism under mg narega because currently these workers can only voice their disappointments through activist or ngo and there is no proper grievance mechanism which a worker can follow himself based on discussion please try attempting this mains practice question on the mg narega scheme now based on our today's discussion here are your prelims practice question please try and solve this and we will discuss the answer after 5 seconds the first question reads with reference to coal wetlands which of the following statement is an correct number 1 they are found in the state of tamil nadu this is incorrect they are found in the state of kerala second it is a ramsar convention site this is correct hence the right answer is b two only the second question reads with reference to turtles in india which of the following statement is an correct number 1 majority of turtle species are found in odisha this is incorrect majority of the turtle species are found in the state of assam second the indian softshell turtles is declared as extinct in the wild as per the iucn red list this is again incorrect it is not the indian softshell turtle but the black softshell turtle which has been declared as extinct in the wild as per the iucn red list therefore the right answer becomes d neither one nor two here are the next set of questions please pause the video and solve these two we'll discuss the answer after 5 seconds The third question reads with reference to MG Narega which of the following statements are correct Number 1 it is implemented by the Ministry of Rural Development this is right Second it provides 100 days wage employment to rural households this is also correct Hence the right answer is C both 1 and 2 The fourth question says National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority is under which ministry So the right answer is A Ministry of Chemical and Fertilizers With this we come to an end for today's discussion let's move on to the question for the day